we've been having a conversation about qualitative methods and qualitative research and how we can use more rich and qualitative uh, data to describe the world, to generate hypotheses, and to test causal arguments. And I think it's worth having a conversation about some of the things that historians who spend lots of time working with documents have um, developed in terms of their insights into how that craft of, of history works. So I'll just begin when we're, we're thinking in historical context, it's really critical that our pool of potential social science tools is greatly limited. We have no real way to access the past as, as human beings. We are fixed and rooted in the present. And so if data wasn't collected in the past, we can't go back and do interviews. People who are, are dead, um, even if they're not dead, if we go back and do interviews after the fact, we're not necessarily getting an accurate depiction of what they were thinking, of what their motives were, of what was happening at a particular time, because people's memories are sketchy. We, we rewrite the past in our heads uh, over time. We have motivated reasoning where we take what happened and we give it meaning to help explain what happened after or to give ourselves more agency. And we can't go out and get sort of better information by observing the world because that world that we might be interested in studying, that world of the past is gone. And so we are limited as researchers to working with the kind of information that is available, which is primarily written documents or physical depictions, art and statues, that kind of thing, of the past that can allow us to access the past from our position in the present. That makes sense. But once you start recognizing that, that you're only able to access the past from the present through things that have survived and been, been brought down to us, then analyzing the past becomes sort of a, a bad sampling problem. And what I mean by that, and this is um, a, a graphic that really helps sort of, you know, capture this for me, and this is something that was still by Kenneth Bolin and talking about how we measure democracy based on you know, foreign news accounts and how, how just ridiculously biased that is, that if we think about everything that's out there in the world that's ever happened, right, only a tiny chunk of that ever gets recorded. And stuff that gets recorded, like in diaries or letters, a lot of that just gets lost, right? Very few people keep a diary consistently, and even fewer people sort of arrange to have that diary stored at, a, at an archive. Right. So it's just very, very little information that actually gets passed on to a larger audience. Um, very little of that information actually gets read and analyzed and, and reported on, much less reported in a venue where you might have access to it, and then you still have to read it. And when we factor in you know, things related to language you know, differences and, and what gets translated and what doesn't, it becomes very clear that the information that we are getting has gone through a selection process that's really biased it in, in some powerful ways, right? So just thinking about that process of, of who records things. You record things, you write things down if you're illiterate. Uh, the vast majority of the life experiences of people who are illiterate have been lost for, for more or less all time. Um, maybe they can be accessed through the archaeological record or through accounts of literate people talking about illiterate people. But a lot of that sort of firsthand, this was my life experience, we just don't have it because it wasn't written. And then we have to think about, you know, what gets saved and what gets stored. It takes a very kind of um, a, a high sense of self to believe that your private papers are going to be of interest to history and to have that attitude early on enough in life that you actually, you know, keep track of things and file things and, and you know, lug boxes of letters from one you know, house to another as you move and progress through life on the belief that at some point somebody's really going to want to study you. So another way to think about this sort of bias selection process, um, I think maybe may resonate more with folks today, is to think about sort of phones and what we see on the internet through social media, right? So if you think about all of the things that a person ever experiences, but only a subset of that gets recorded on the phone and in video or a, a picture or notes that you take, and then only a chunk of that stuff that you might record on a phone is going to be posted to social media where other people are going to be able to have access to it. Um, only a small chunk of what we post to social media gets viewed, right, because of algorithms that determine who sees what, right, I can post something and only my three closest friends ever see it. 
because the algorithms have decided that my stuff is not of interest to the vast majority of people that follow me or I follow. I presume that's why it's so few likes on things. But all right, so you know, people have to be able to see it. They have to be able to share it, and it sort of goes out. And some things get viral and get shared widely. And sometimes I see things that have gone viral, and I've had sort of you know. Now I've had that experience, but it would be ridiculous to say, I've seen this viral video of a person, therefore I know what their life is like. Nobody would say that, right? We, we recognize that that moment, that snapshot is out of context and came to us through sort of a weird process. And we wouldn't, I don't think, feel comfortable declaring that we understand in any sort of rich and meaningful way what a person's life is like based on you know a, a 20 second snippet of video that was shared widely on the internet okay so i'm going on about this because i think it's an important thing to recognize the documents that we're working with to access the past are biased in the process by which they came down to us okay historical um research 102 another sort of keen insight from our friends over in his history uh, documents are not created so that we can do research. No one creates a document thinking, at some point, historians will like to have this. Wouldn't it be handy for them if we assembled this thing for them, you know, for their purposes? That's not why documents get created. Documents get created by people for their own purposes. And so I'll, I'll tell a story about this. I think really like capture this for me. So I worked uh, with a historian, Robert Gross, uh, who, who had written a book uh, on Concord, Massachusetts. He was sort of the world's foremost expert on Concord, Massachusetts, knew sort of everybody in the town. And in his youth, he had done a bunch of archival research in Concord, and he had sort of translated things into, um, into computer files, which I was then sort of putting into databases, and we were analyzing. And we found a computer file that had people who had signed a petition, uh, an abolitionist petition that was sent to Boston, right? So this is people who are against slavery and who are mobilizing and they're sending this petition to Boston. And there were like, you know, 30 people who had signed this petition. And Robert Gross was really keen on this because he was like, this is essentially like a public opinion sample of attitudes in Concord, Massachusetts. Now we know who was against, like, against um, slavery. And I said, well, is that really a, a, a sample? Because it's not done through a random process. Um, it, it seems like that availability sampling, right? Where I sort of stand on a corner and sort of, you know, snag people as they walk by. And that, that might not be a good method, right? Should we trust, trust the state? And he said, well, no, Concord was a small enough town that everybody knew everybody else's politics. And if you were trying to assemble a petition, it wouldn't take you more than a couple afternoons to wander around town and knock on the door of everybody who supported abolition uh, and get their signature. And so that was sort of what he was imagining was, was sort of the, the process that generated that document. He then noticed that um, there were like five of the names were children. Um, we had also collected information on birth dates and sort of had a, a whole database on everybody in the, in the town um, and, and a bunch of them were children. And he was like, wow, what does this tell us about, you know, ideas about citizenship and at what point you become a member of a political community. And it was really interesting sort of puzzle to, to wrestle with in terms of how people in Concord, Massachusetts in 1835 thought about their world. And then he went back to the archives in Concord and discovered that that list that he had was the, not on like a normal sheet of paper, it was the back of a magazine. It was the back of the abolitionist magazine for Massachusetts. And suddenly discovering that, that that list wasn't somebody who was passionate about abolition and collected a bunch of signatures to send to um, Boston to spur legislators in Boston to, to you know, advocate for the abolition um, of slavery, that story of sort of a, a organic process that emerged out of um, somebody's internal desire suddenly fell apart. And suddenly that story of collecting signatures became less about something happening in Concord, Massachusetts, and instead all the abolitionist organizations across the entire state were getting this magazine and being told, collect signatures from your members and send it in. And we're going to flood um, Boston with these with these letters with these signatures, and so suddenly that data generation process looks different. Suddenly, it's the abolitionist society is meeting, 
and there's 27 members or so. Bob had actually found that there were 27 members and he had 26 adult signatures. Somebody was sick or couldn't get through the weather or whatever, missed the meeting. Um, and <laughs> suddenly it's there, they're at the meeting and they pass it around the room and they all sign. And then they get the kids up out of bed who are sort of, you know, sleeping in the other room. And they're like, oh, we need more signatures. We want you to sign children. It's not that they were sort of, you know, part of this larger conversation about what it means to be a citizen and what it means to be you know, a member of a public community was we need as many signatures as we can because this goes into the mail tomorrow morning. That's a very different data generation process, different data generation process, and it's producing a different kind of result. Right? Before it was, these are all the people who support abolition in our community. Now it's, this is the hardcore. These are the people who belong to the abolitionist society. Um, and there's probably a lot of other people out there who are sympathetic to um, abolition, but aren't getting themselves, you know, across town in the middle of the night on cold winter nights to participate in meetings. So whenever we have a document in front of us, it's worth thinking about how did that document come to be created? Who was responsible for that? What were they thinking? What was their motivation? What was the context in which somebody sat down and generated that thing? And when we sort of tell ourselves that story about why that document exists, that can key us into the limits of that document, the biases of that document, um, the blind spots that might come with that document. So I think that's, that's always good to keep in mind when we're thinking about about documents. It also sort of keys us in that we shouldn't just simply take things at face value, that, that documents can be biased or can tell stories that we're not necessarily aware of um, until we sort of understand the larger context. Okay, I would also flag that people's memories of the past are unreliable. I think I've um, mentioned this before, um, that we interpret the past in light of what's happened, but also every time we recall a memory, our brain is like accessing those neural pathways, but those neural pathways aren't fixed. They change and evolve and, and link things together. And so every time we access a memory, we're tying that set of neural connections to other neural connections. And we, can, we are literally rewriting our understanding and our observations of the past in a way that we oftentimes will ascribe more agency to ourselves. Um, I was the doer in this situation rather than along for the ride. Um, we can invent um, sensations and, and memories. Um, the, so, I think Carrie Miller, a, a Minnesota Public Radio host, was talking about an event where she remembered her father falling off the roof. Um, like she had it visually, like she recalled the sound, but it turns out she hadn't been home when that happened. It had just been something that she had heard about. It was, it, it was important. She had pictured herself there, thought about you know, what she would have done. And in the process of time and accessing that memory, she had rewritten the past such that she was there. And so when we are accessing the past, we need to be cognizant of that, that just because we have a piece of evidence in front of us that points to something, doesn't mean that that evidence is necessarily conclusive and needs to be taken into the larger context of of everything that's sort of going on. Okay, a third observation that comes to us from historians is that there is no such thing as history. It, it doesn't exist. Um, it's not out there to be accessed. There's documents about the past. And the act of uh, being a historian means that you engage in the act of creating a history. You take that information about the past you try to understand it, you try to see the limitations of it, you try to organize it in a way that makes sense, is coherent, where there's meaning. And that process of creating meaning happens in the mind of the historian. Right? Does not mean that we're just sort of making things up, right? Um, it doesn't mean that it's all sort of arbitrary. A good history, um, a good account of history is going to be coherent, right? It's going to be persuasive to other people. It's going to wrestle with the available evidence in, in a way that makes sense and is persuasive and, and doesn't leave things out, isn't obviously biased. Like that, that process um, can still be rigorous, but it's a process that's really hard to observe because that's a process that takes place in the mind of the, the historian, in our own minds as we create meaning out of data that doesn't have meaning um, in and of itself. And so this 
could raise sort of a provocative question about whether um, qualitative research is actually scientific because a big part of science is the idea of transparency and replicability. And if I can't observe sort of how you're fitting things together in your own mind, I, I, how do I know that you've done it correctly? Um, I think that, again, I think it's a provocative question because I, I um, it's, a, it's something that people say, for example, historians will say, no, what we're doing is not science, what we're doing is, is an art form, it's, it's a humanities. Um, economists likewise say, you know, this is not scientific, it does not rise to our standards of, you know, transparency and replicability and all these other things that we consider to be scientific. But I think most social scientists would sort of shrug and say, okay, it, it's maybe a little messier than just simply math on data, but it would be false to suggest that sort of statistics don't involve us sort of creating meaning, and we'll talk about that as well later on. Um, in addition, there are things about it that can make it more scientific, right? So you're sharing your data, you're being transparent, you're saying this is what I did, this is how I did it. Um, I may be using a particular method of a case study. Um, maybe I'm providing anonymized field notes that I'm sharing with other people that they can look at. Maybe you're just finding my account persuasive. Maybe you don't need to observe my thought process about how I created meaning. You just simply need to, to see the, the final output, this story that I've crafted um, using the information available to me. And you look at that and say, okay, that squares the information that's available to me. And I see how you, you assemble that information. Um, I see what evidence you're drawing on and I can go back and, you know, maybe access some of that and, and confirm that, that this more or less lines up and is, is rigorous and not um, fictitious, I guess. Um, but again, it's, it's one of these things where qualitative research is murkier. And I think that the more we acknowledge that, the more we wrestle with that, the easier it is to work with that data in a way that is defensible in a way that's not going to give us biased results. And so the uh, only real advice I can give you is forewarned is forearmed. 